you are an avid fan of The Legend of Robin Hood, whether you grew up with the Disney movie, or enjoy the campiness of Errol Flynn, or you just can't stop quoting men in tights, you may have come all the way to the city of Nottingham to visit the famous castle where many of our friendly outlaws' exploits took place. And in getting there, you may have wondered, why doesn't Nottingham Castle look like a castle? Well, the short answer is Oliver Cromwell. The long answer is very complicated. And no, it was not because Robin Hood blew it up with the Sheriff of Nottingham inside while Robin himself was dying of a poisoned wound. That show is weird. As a Nottingham native and former Sheriff's Lady, I'd like to make this brief video giving a historical and personal recollection of Nottingham Castle. Nottingham Castle was Norman in origin, although the town and later city of Nottingham was an Anglo-Saxon settlement founded in the Kingdom of Mercia. Before the Norman invasion, it was called Snottingham, after the chieftain named Snot, yes really, who took over the settlement. When William the Conqueror was journeying north to York, he saw a tactical advantage that a castle in Nottingham would have. The use of the rivers Trent and Lean allowed trading access to the north, and the view from what would come to be known as Castle Rock, a craggy outcrop of sandstone with a network of caves beneath it, allowed someone to see from miles around. The Norman castle structure, better known as the Motton Bailey, had a keep at the highest point and was surrounded by one or two outer walls, making it potentially impregnable. In a town where there would be few, if any, high buildings to obscure the view of the castle, its might would be visible for miles around a demonstration of the Crown's authority. The castle belonged to the royal family, a place to visit while on progress or on the warpath. It was very rarely occupied by the royal family, however, although Henry II, son of Empress Matilda and father to Richard the Lionheart and King John, spent Christmas there in 1180. He would also replace the original timber fort and inner bailey walls with stone, turning it into a palace fortress complete with separate apartments for the king and queen, and a deer park for hunting. When the royals were absent, it was overlooked by a constable. The legend of Robin Hood often shows the outlaw and his merry men frequently infiltrating the castle under the nose of the Sheriff of Nottingham and stealing the treasure to give to the poor. Simon Thurley observes that if you want to get an idea of what Nottingham Castle looked like in the height of the medieval period, then compare it with Peveril Castle in Castleton, Derbyshire. Fortunately, I have been to that castle twice, and I have the bookmark to prove it. The keep inside the walls, while in ruins, still exists, and you get a feel of the tactical advantage defending such a place would hold, as well as the fact that when the enemy can only enter through one side, thanks to there being a sheer drop on the other, you can understand why these castles held out for so long. The reason why the reigns of Richard I and King John are so well associated with Nottingham is because, by the former's reign, they were the only two remaining sons of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Henry II had originally divided his empire for his sons to rule, but that changed when Henry and Geoffrey died, and also rebelled against their father, but that's a very long story which I don't have time for here. Richard the Lionheart was more interested in his French territories and fighting Saracens in the Holy Land. Thus, he left England after his coronation, and left John a sizeable amount of land to lessen the risk of him taking the throne while he was away. The catch was that Richard gave John the lands but not the castles, money, but not the power. Back then, money did not always equal power. Military prowess and blood meant power. John was ordered to stay in France for three years, an order which he ignored, and for the first and last time in his life, he returned to England with the support of barons from France and England. John persuaded the constable of Nottingham Castle to give him ownership. Richard could not stop him, as by then he had been captured by Leopold of Austria. John thus declared himself King of England, refusing to relent when news of his brother's release reached him. Thus, Nottingham Castle was under siege in March of 1194. He who held the castle held the Midlands and the gateway to the north. When Richard arrived, one of John's commanders was said to have died from fright. The siege lasted for 16 days between the 12th and the 28th of March. Richard made sure he could be seen, but not harmed, and put his full knowledge of siege warfare to good use. This included the use of Sicilian rock for projectiles, siege towers, longbowmen, and possibly even Greek fire. 
Damn! Richard the Lionheart was metal. Why don't we ever see this in the Robin Hood movies? By the 25th, Richard had seized the Outer Bailey. A parley began on the 26th, confirming that Richard was indeed there. Many of John's commanders abandoned him and surrendered to Richard. John himself was pardoned by Richard and sated by the offer of being Richard's heir over their nephew Arthur. From this day forth, all the toilets in this kingdom shall be known as John's. <laughs> Although John would later have Arthur killed, allegedly. During John's reign, he rebuilt the outer bailey of Nottingham Castle with stone defences. The other famous event related to Nottingham Castle occurred 136 years later, during the reign of Edward III. This young king had assumed the throne after his mother, Isabella of France, also known as the She-Wolf, and her lover, Roger Mortimer, had overthrown Edward II and murdered him in Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire. They intended to rule England together through her son. Edward and a handful of companions snuck into the castle on the 19th of October 1330 through a secret tunnel in Castle Rock surprising Isabella and Mortimer when they were in bed together. They were dragged out of the castle, where Isabella would be forced into partial exile in Norfolk, and Mortimer was executed in the Tower of London. Edward III used the castle as a royal residence, as well as a prison for King David II of Scotland. Richard II likewise used it as a prison for London dignitaries, including the Lord Mayor, in 1392. During the Wars of the Roses, Edward IV declared himself king in Nottingham and used the castle as a stronghold. It was also one of the final stops on Richard III's journey to Bosworth Field in 1485. Come the 17th century and Nottingham Castle was not as grand as it used to be. There are only a few mentions of Henry VII and Henry VIII visiting. The latter increased the garrison there in 1536, which served useful to him as the Pilgrimage of Grace began at this time. The uprising never reached as far south as Nottingham, but Henry always wanted troops ready to defend him. In 1538, the castle was reported to have lost some of its roof of the Great Hall, and the Earl of Rutland, Thomas Manners, appealed for repairs. Not much else happened here in terms of reinforcing the castle's defences, however. The bigger threat to England at the time was foreign invasion, so funds were instead concentrated on the coastlines and the border with Scotland. By 1617, the Great Hall of the Castle had been demolished. Its effect as a symbol of royal authority was its only function as it continued to tower over the town citizens. Nottingham Castle did not become historically significant again until 1642. On the 10th of January, King Charles I fled London with supporters from the aristocracy and nobility. He chose Nottingham Castle to be his base, partly due to Richard the Lionheart's assertion of his kingly authority there. Two days later, Charles declared the beginning of the English Civil War. However, the castle was not a strategic asset to the Cavaliers, and the townspeople did not side with the king. Charles relocated to Coventry, and the Roundheads held the castle throughout the rest of the war, under the command of John Hutchinson. Sir John Byron, a cavalier who owned Newstead Abbey and was ancestor of Lord Byron, attempted to retake Nottingham in September 1643. They managed to take the town and began to besiege the castle for the first time in centuries. Hutchinson held out for five days before reinforcements arrived. Byron fled while many were captured and thrown into the castle dungeon, known as the Lion's Den. Hutchinson's wife Lucy cared for the wounded parliamentarians. There was a huge celebratory feast not long after, and the Hutchinsons invited some of their prisoners to dine with them. Another attempted siege a year later failed, not long before it started. Oliver Cromwell, upon winning the Civil War and executing Charles I, decided that many castles which had been used by both sides were too strategically dangerous to be allowed to stay standing. Many castles would be significantly demolished to avoid ever being used as military strongholds again. Some would be ruined entirely, with only their foundations remaining. Some stayed, but in severe ruins like Kenilworth, Newark and Pontefract. Nottingham Castle was ordered to be demolished within two weeks. In truth, it took four months. All that remained of the original foundations were the walls of the Outer Bailey and the Gatehouse. If you're a member of English heritage, you've likely visited many castles that shared the same fate. Conservation of the nation's relics was not taken as seriously then as it is now. And that, kids, is why Oliver Cromwell can go and do one. So 
I covered why Nottingham Castle doesn't look like a castle, but why does it look the way it does now? After Charles II returned to the throne in 1660, the first Duke of Newcastle, William Cavendish, bought the land upon which the castle used to stand, and built the quote-unquote ducal mansion that sits on top of Castle Rock today. It was completed by Cavendish's son. The architecture was unique for its time, taking inspiration from Italian buildings. The mason behind the construction, Samuel Marsh, also worked on Bolsover Castle in Derbyshire. It would certainly have looked unique against the Tudor and Stuart buildings in Nottingham, which now had a great symbol of wealth and influence standing over it once again. Come the Industrial Revolution, and the castle once again became deserted. Nottingham expanded into a city, accommodating large factories and workers to fill them. You can still see a lot of these buildings throughout the city, although a lot of them have been converted into storage facilities or student flats. And with the Industrial Revolution came slums. The Broadmarsh slums were considered the worst in the whole of the British Empire, and if you have ever seen the view from Nottingham Castle, you'll know that Broadmarsh is not so far away from there. As such, what duke would want to spend his time looking out from their glorious mansion and having to acknowledge that poor people existed? 1831 saw the defeat of the Second Reform Bill in the House of Lords. Due to the population change, with many ordinary folk leaving the country to work in the cities, and the fact that only 5% of the British population was able to vote in a general election, the Whig Party hoped said bill would fix things. Remember, it would not be until 1868 until all men in Britain, regardless of class or wealth, were eligible to vote. And women would not get anything resembling a vote until 1918. The defeat of the bill had a significant backlash. There was unrest in places like Derby, Leicester, Bristol, Exeter, Bath, Worcester, Yeovil, Sherborne, and of course, London. Nottingham received the most memorable impact of it. As the then Duke of Newcastle, Henry Pelham Fines Pelham Clinton opposed the Reform Bill, the rioters marched on the castle on the 9th of October 1831 and set fire to the Ducal Mansion. The Duke was in London at the time. He also owned Clumber Park, which is further up county, but he was able to defend it from the rioters, for all the good it did him. The 1831 riots were considered the closest Britain ever came to a revolution. 26 men were arrested for their actions in the Nottingham riots, but only three were hanged in January of 1832. The Duke was given £21,000, about £1.5 million today, in damages, but he would not restore the castle. It remained literally empty for nearly 50 years, with only the outer walls of the Ducal Mansion remaining. In 1875, restoration of the castle finally went ahead. Three years later, it was opened by the future King Edward VII as a museum. It would be the first municipal art gallery outside London. If you don't live in the UK, you won't know that London does tend to hog all of the arts, so this was a pretty big deal at the time. The castle also served as a history museum, both worldly and local. The castle has since become a recognisable landmark. It was printed on products made by John Player and Sons, a tobacconist in Nottingham. The film adaptation of Saturday Night and Sunday Morning features the castle, as Alan Silito was a Nottingham-based author. Ian Fleming, author of James Bond, also references it in Thunderball. Nottingham isn't one of those cities with tons of skyscrapers, and it's not very big. So when you're at a high point in the city, you can see where it ends and the countryside begins. From the castle, you never really get tired of the view and on the clearest days you can see all the way out to Beaver Castle, which is a good 20 miles away. I'm exceptionally long-sighted so I can see very, very far. It's kind of my superpower, although the setback is I can't look at a computer screen for more than five minutes without getting eye strain. Outside the castle walt, if you head downhill, you'll find Robin Hood's statue and those of his merry men. Follow the hill to the bottom and you will see where the stone of the castle is embedded into the sandstone of the rock. Eventually, you will come to Ye Old Trip to Jerusalem, a pub built into Castle Rock. It was allegedly established in 1189, the year of Richard the Lionheart's succession. So, a castle which Simon Thurley in his book Lost Buildings of Britain called Architecture as Tyranny, turned from a symbol of might to a tourist destination in just under a thousand years.
when you live in one of those cities that has a pretty famous monument attached to it, you don't often go unless you're on a field trip, there's an event there, or you have friends visiting from out of town, and it seems like a fun thing to do. Those are all the reasons why I have visited Nottingham Castle. When I was in primary school, we went at least three times because of activities and exhibitions to do with whatever we were studying at the time. Ancient Egypt, Ancient Greece, Ancient Rome. Hey, kitty, 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 kitty. Ancient Egypt was so much fun to study back in year three. Everything was just so colourful. One time when we went on a field trip to the castle, it wasn't until we were on the bus that I realised I didn't bring my lunchbox. So one of the teachers had to buy me food from the cafe and I had this massive cookie with a ghost on it. And it was so cool, it took me forever to finish. There used to be these giant lollipops with a picture of the castle on them, but I'd never have any money for them. So when other kids got to have them, I would watch them enviously. Then once, me and my family went there for a day and I was allowed to have one, and I was so happy. One of my favorite memories of Nottingham Castle would have to be the joust that happened there in 2014. You heard that right, an actual joust with horses and everything. As my mother was on the city council at the time, we were invited to watch. There was a drinks reception inside the castle beforehand, and there was honest-to-God mead. I love mead. The joust involved some Robin Hood elements in it, where Robin Hood and Sir Guy of Gisborne were competing for the hand of Maid Marian, which Robin obviously won. It took place in the evening, and it was mostly lit with torches. Afterwards, I got to meet the horses, and I distinctly remember Gisborne's horse chubby rubbing his head against me. A lot of animals rubbed their heads on me. I guess that's the consequence of being a Disney princess. By the time the castle closed in 2018, I'd been there so many times that I pretty much knew the layout of the interior by heart. You would always enter into the gift shop, regardless of which entrance you used. One gallery would have text saying every object tells a story, while the other led to a collection of fabrics and clothing from different time periods. Lace making was a long-held tradition in Nottingham. We had a whole market for it. Up until quite recently, we still had authentic lace makers that dated all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. Sadly, that has closed down thanks to the pandemic and Brexit. The week before the castle closed, it was allowing free entry, so I made sure to go there before it shut. And I'm glad I did, because we had to wait so long for it to reopen. Later that summer, my mother and I were there for a documentary filming. She was the Sheriff of Nottingham at the time. I was Sheriff's Lady. We went inside for a total of five minutes, and all the display cases were empty and were in the process of being dismantled. It was harrowing. I didn't realise how much the place had meant to me until I saw that. Because of the pandemic, it took longer than planned for the reopening. When it did reopen, it was under the control of a trust independent from the council. And incompetence is not the right word for it. Maladroit is better. More dramatic. Well, they charged way too much for a ticket. If you were a Nottingham local, you got a discount, but it didn't seem worth it. Following this, there was so much controversy on the board of trustees, citing racism, bullying and harassment. Unable to attract visitors, the Nottingham Castle Trust declared liquidation in November of 2022. The castle's ownership and operation was placed back into the city council's hands. At this time, I was working in Leicester, so I was commuting between cities. By habit, every time the train left the station and returned, I would look out the window to try and spot it. Like, if you're an American, say you lived in St. Louis, and tried to spot the gateway arch from the train. Maybe if you look really closely, you can see Percy Jackson falling from it. Finally, in June last year, Nottingham Castle reopened to the public. I was there for the opening, getting an advanced view of the grounds before the gates reopened. It was a beautiful day for it. And yes, I wore my medieval dress. Robin Hood was there. He encouraged a group of school children to open the castle gates with him, and the price of entry is like £12, but the perk is that the ticket lasts for the whole year. The same goes for the Bronte Museum in Haworth and Bletchley Park. One thing I was really excited about seeing was this painting of Mary Queen of Scots being led to her execution. That is my favourite painting in the entire museum. Sadly, it was not on display when I went, nor was the painting of Amy Robsart at the bottom of the stairs. The irony was that the painting was hanging on one of the staircases. I know the council still has the Mary Queen of Scots painting in its collection. They just rotate what gets put up. Maybe it's at Newstead Abbey. Regardless, there was something so comforting about being there again. It was as if I'd come home. 
This video got a lot longer than I was expecting. This subject was a lot more interesting than I thought. I'm not sponsored by anyone in making this video. I've just had a real fondness for Nottingham Castle that I didn't realise I had. I was surprised to learn that it was a symbol of tyranny, when I've always seen it as a place to have an adventure or learn something new. It's always a comforting place to go to as you discover that the world around you is bigger than you may think, that you're part of something larger than yourself. Nottingham is a city built on defiance, as well as sandstone. The people defied King Charles I and rioted in the face of upper-class ignorance. Robin Hood is an eternal legend built on sticking it to the man. The museum is a publicly owned institution and serves the common good. The people of Nottingham run the castle now, not the crown. Unfortunately, last year, Nottingham City Council had to declare bankruptcy. It is not alone thanks to austerity measures brought on by nearly 14 years of Tory misrule. And of course, they want to cut the arts because Tories don't think that poor people need art or food or healthcare or teeth or education. I don't know how the running of the castle will fit into how the government will manage the council's budget. We saw that putting it into a private trust didn't work and it appears to be attracting a sizeable crowd now. Nottingham Castle is a beautiful place and it does not deserve to be mishandled again. Before we go, I just want to thank my patrons who support the channel. You can become a member yourself by following the link in the description. My highest tier contributors, my King and Queen patrons, get a shout out in the credits. So thank you, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill Minero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. Now this video is done, it's full speed ahead to the Romeo and Juliet hot takes.